hi, Nick Vince here. This week's guest really is one of the great modern horror movie monsters. Jonathan Breck has played the Creeper in all three Jeepers Creepers films. And we discuss creating the Creeper and much more right after this. And we're back with Jonathan Breck, who played the Creeper in the Jeepers Creepers films. A monster who had a really cool way of finding his victims. He could simply smell their fear. Do you come from an acting family? Is that something that your family are associated with? Absolutely not. We're, let's jump right in, buddy. Yeah, no, no. My family is... Uh, I come from a pretty conservative family, uh, in the southern part of the U.S. and you know acting was never something that was taken seriously at least you know nobody ever thought that you know you could make a living with it it was something that you know you did and it was cute when you were in school and all that you know but it was never really taken seriously my parents were way too you know practical for that right um right. but I kind of fell to it naturally you know I started doing it in school and um it's interesting I I can remember now, and my mom reminds me, is I used to be the kid in the neighborhood that would host all the haunted houses. And so I never saw myself working in horror. I never saw myself really being a professional actor, but certainly not working in horror. And then I remember back, I was the kid that would host the homemade haunted houses. And my mom would always get mad at me because I never knew when to stop scaring the shit out of the kids. It would come down. I just kept pressing the envelope, you know, she would be like, why do you, I'm like, I don't know. There's something in me. I love it. You know? So, uh, no, back to your question. My parents thought I was quite, quite strange, you know, for, you know, my passion for acting. Um, they never quite figured me out. Still haven't by the way. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that yeah. my parents are always very proud of me. And the, once they kind of got used to the idea, then they were fully supportive. Yeah. And then, you know, but the rest of the family. I haven't come around yet, Nick. You'll, you'll have to tell me how that is. I'm still, <laughs> still working on that. So. <laughs> so where did you train as an actor then? Well, I, I came by it late, really. I, um, interesting story, you know, just because of my background, I wasn't a classically trained actor because I didn't see myself going on for a career in acting. I actually got out, I went to college and minored in acting, but didn't major in acting and then got into the business world for a few years. Right. What my parents always wanted me to do, right? And, you know, after a few years of having, I think what most people would think was success, being completely empty inside, you know, just feeling like, God, it's gotta be something more to life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was living on the East Coast at the time, um, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Coast at the time. Um, and I remember thinking, God, there's, I, I have to do something that I'm passionate about with my life. I have to do something that gets me up and keeps me working until two o'clock in the morning because I want to, you know, I mean, I wanted all those things. So um, I just quit my walk in and quit my job one day and I threw everything I owned in a U-Haul and I moved out to L.A. I didn't know one person. I did it the old fashioned way, you know, like, like all the TV shows and, uh, and became an actor kind of late in life. You know, I was 28 really before I even started trying, attempting to act full time. And wow. so I got to Hollywood, you know, in my U-Haul and then I panicked because I realized I really didn't have any formal training at all to speak of other than just acting in school on plays on stage a lot. Um, so I got into an acting studio there with a teacher named Howard Fine, who's a great uh, acting teacher. He taught me a lot of the basics. And then I went to the Beverly Hills Playhouse, Milton Caselas in Beverly Hills, who's right. you know, legendary. And he, he taught me a lot about acting and about life for that matter. So I kind of came in my training, I backed into it, let's say. Right, right, right. And did I read somewhere that you trained in dancing? You did some dance training as well? Yeah, Milton, he made me do some dance training. And that was a very big part of his training in acting school because he felt like not only for movement and breath, which is really important, mm -hmm. but also for improvisation. 
you know, I mean, I, I must admit when he first demanded that I go to a dance class, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Come on, Milton, you know, but there was a method to the madness because I found, you know, when I was dancing, I didn't have time to think about anything. I just rolled into the next move. And it's that kind of instinct of creation that he was looking for you know, for us to apply to our acting work, you know, and I, I found those aha moments in dance. Um, so not only did it help me physically, I think, and you kind of see it in the characters I play, but also it helped me just trust my instincts and, and push my instincts, you know? Right. So, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating, isn't it? The way that movement, as you say, is, it's more than just breath. It's the whole body. I think of people, people it's like- all related, Jones. man. It's all connected, you mm. know? So, yeah, yeah. I had, to, I had to stop. I had to get beyond the neck, right down in the whole body, you know, for acting to fully live. I mean, and look, I probably wouldn't have gotten the role of the, the creeper if I didn't have that physicality, right? Along with everything else I was doing, you know. So it really, it's funny how life takes us, you know. Right. Yeah. No. It 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 all comes into play at some point or another. So, what was the first job that you got in? Hollywood as an actor. I got a job on Star Trek Voyager. Do you remember that show? I do. Yeah, I got a job um, and I played a Borg in the show, but it was like a featured Borg on one episode. And I got to like die in, in uh, what was, who's seven of nine? The, um, God, her name escapes me right now. You know who I'm talking I about. I know the you actress. Know. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. I think, yes. And I got that job and everybody was kind of freaking out. It's like, oh, you're working with seven of nine, you know, and because my all my scenes were with seven of nine. And matter of fact, I think I die in her arms and we have this very intimate little scene and everybody was all charged up about it. And I was like, I don't who's seven or what are you, what are you talking? Who's seven of nine? And then I got to the set and I was like, boy, did I see who seven of nine was? Yeah, she was something and a lovely lady, by the way. But that was my first gig and my first foray into prosthetics strangely enough too right 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 so before so that was your first job did you do another job i married a monster or something like that did i see that on your oh right around the same time i did right. i did another one i always considered it star trek voyager to be my first gig but maybe if i were going back maybe it was i married a monster it was a remake from a 50s movie right right uh yeah yeah i married a monster yeah <laughs> So from outer space, if you were right. to get the real title. Yeah, I married a monster from outer space. <laughs> so. But hey, the, the Star Trek Voyager thing is fascinating. Yeah, I'm working with 709. I can imagine. That was an amazing costume that lady wore. Yeah. Yes, the bodysuit was was quite nice. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So moving on then to, to Jeepers Creepers, um, were you a fan of horror films before you did? Well, it sounds as if you might have been if you were doing all the local... Well, you know, strangely enough, I wasn't. I wasn't because I, my family didn't expose me to it. I didn't really have any friends that were particularly into horror. I mean, beyond, you know, Friday the 13th, right? I mean, I saw the big ones, but um, I didn't really have any exposure to that. And I remember being, when I first got Jeepers Creepers and it occurred to me that I might have to give one or two interviews um, and I'm sure that question was going to come up and I was quite nervous about it because I was like, you know, I, I feel like an idiot because I really don't have I'm not this big horror fan. You know, I didn't grow up watching horror and appreciating horror. And I remember thinking that, you know, somehow it was going to come off well. And, and then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, this really probably helped me in this role because I didn't have any preconceived ideas or notions of anybody before me, you know, I really kind of came in it fresh. I didn't approach the character, even unconsciously thinking about some horror actor that I watched back whenever I really kind of came at it. I think it helped me come at it a little bit more organically. Now, since I've become a huge horror fan, right. Uh, right. all of our friends that we hang out with, you know, yeah. just because I, I've gotten to know them and I love them and respect their work so much, I've wanted to go back and watch all of it. So I'm a giant horror fan now. Um, also because I realized how much goes into it, which I wasn't aware of before, but growing up, I was not at all, you know, I was, a, a you know, pop movies, basically, you know, so it's like every other suburban kid, probably. Yeah. 
yeah that that makes perfect sense sense so what was the audition process like for jeepers creepers well it was <laughs> it was pretty nutty by the way for your fans that are catching this they've actually um recorded victor recorded my very first audition this is before i even met him so the very first time i walked in the room to meet them he had the old vc you know videotape going yeah yeah I, he taped my original audition and it's since been posted on YouTube. So if any of your fans or anybody listening to the show is curious about seeing my original audition, you can see it on there. But um, it was really interesting. I, I got a call from my agent, you know, the typical way you get scripts sent to you or mm -hmm. called auditions. And he said, I've got an interesting little project for you. Um, you know, it's actually being produced by Francis Ford Coppola. And then of course I didn't hear anything else after that. Right? Yeah. Like sign me up, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so they said, and so I said, well, you know, send me the script, send me the sides. And they said, well, we don't have the script, but we, you know, we have a little description of the character. And I was like, normally, you know, you get sides, right? That you audition with lines. And they're like, well, this character doesn't have any lines. And I was like, well, what do they want me to audition with? I mean, what do they want me to do? <laughs> and they said, well, they want you to just to come in the room and just be the character. And so, you know, fortunately for, for this audition, I had about a week, they gave me, you know, some notice, which doesn't happen a lot. And they gave me about a week. So I really had a week to meditate on it. And I thought about it and they sent me a couple lines. They said, we really don't know much about him. We're kind of figuring it all out, but you know, we know he's probably several thousand years old and we know he eats people. And that was really it, you know, I had to go on, but he didn't speak, right. He didn't have any lines. So, you know, I had about a week to just like noodle on it. And I thought, well, you know, this character is, it's all going to be about his behavior, his mannerisms. That's how he communicates. So, you know, I went into the animal world. I studied a lot of animals. Um, you know, I put traits together of a super predator. So I had all the body movement. I really had, you know, I thought about, you know, this character uh, being alone a lot and how he would operate, you know, being alone and maybe what his passions were right you know smelling you know the hunt was his passion it was his mm -hmm. sex it was his art it was everything you know so that was everything he put into it and so i created this this character uh that i felt really good about but i still felt like you know i felt like i was about 95 percent of the way there but not 100 percent, you know and literally i i shit you not about three o'clock in the morning the night before the audition I woke up and I thought, that's it. I have to shave my head. Because I had long blonde hair at the time. You know, I looked like a surfer boy from Southern California. And that was the thing that was missing. I, I didn't feel like I looked, I had the intensity or the look, even though I might have the behavior and the character, I didn't feel like I was really going to scare anybody coming in that room, you know? And so I woke up and I thought, yeah, I've I've got to shave my head because it makes sense. This character, after all, he's eating people. So he'd want to be clean and shorn. So cleanup could be easy. And so all the tumblers started falling into place is at three o'clock in the morning, right? <clears throat> so I went down the hall and woke up my roommate, you know, I was like, Doug, he's like, oh, uh, you got to shave my head. <laughs> he's like, what the fuck? So I got him up in the middle of the night. He, my roommate shaved my head and, um, and that's interesting. I mean, it, you you know, obviously you've mm -hmm. got a you know bald head, but the the first time you shave your head, it just it just does something to you. You know, you look in the mirror for the first time, and it just it just it kind of exposes you. You feel just an intensity. I did at least. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say. I remember at drama school, somebody had to shave their head for a part, yeah. and they were advised and said, "Do it in stages." just do it in stages do it in about two of them because the shock talking. yeah because otherwise the only time that they tend to do this to you is if you're going into prison or the army right or you're sick oh you're sick yeah yeah no, absolutely well it, it it uh it really everything kind of dropped away for me it was the last cog kind of fell into place mm. um and then I called my agent the next morning and said, uh, I'm thinking of shaving my head for this audition. And they said, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I was making this call completely shorn. 
They said, what if you don't get this? This is just a first audition. I was like, hey, you know, if you feel it, you feel it, right? And that really, and then when I met Victor for the first time in the audition, you know, I came in and sat down. And like so many auditions, you've been in a lot of them, you know, mm. this was an advanced audition in terms of the number of people that were there, because I guess they'd been looking for this character for a while, for whatever reason. And time was short. And so they, they had all, a lot of producers in the room for the first audition. And so it was a crowded room. I remember coming in, you know, I say crowded, eight to 10 people probably. And That's I was like, yeah. A lot, you know, for first audition. Yeah. I walked in and, and sat down in my chair on the X, you know, and no even noticed that I came in. They were all, you know, looking at the last actors. They were all busy with stuff. And then I never forget, you know, Victor looked up at me looked at me for a minute and he looked down and I could tell he was looking at my headshot. He was, and he looked up again, he looked down and he goes, you don't have any hair. And I said, well, sir, this character wouldn't have hair. So I shaved it. And at that moment, I felt the whole room just went Whoop, and everybody looked up and I was like, I got him. That was the thing. Yeah, yeah I had the character, but that was the thing that put yeah. me over the edge and Boy, what a lesson in trusting your instincts. You know, that was a, one of the most valuable lessons I've ever learned in my life. Right, you know, right. Trust your instincts, you know. Wow, wow. So. Uh, I admire your chutzpah, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait till you see that. And the other thing about the audition was so, so funny. And, you know, I've befriended Courtney Gaines. We're, we're good friends. And uh, we've been on stage for a few Q&As and, it's so funny because, you know, in early acting school, one of the things they preach to you is don't ever threaten or physically touch or, you know, go over across the line. It's the kiss of death. Don't ever, whatever you do, you know, don't ever, you know, go over the line with a casting director or whatever. Never supposed to touch them or invade their physical space. You've heard it all, right? Yeah. Yeah. But when you see that audition, man, I just threw that guy up against the wall and went after him. And, um, and I didn't realize because I was so in it, but apparently they were really, they're really scared. Right. You know, cause I was so locked in to the character, you know, and Courtney, Courtney took a real knife in his audition. He whipped out a giant butcher knife <laughs> and everybody shat themselves. Right. And, and, you know, we did all the things that you're not supposed to do. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know anyway it was fun it was a, it was a legendary it was just a it's such a great great experience you know yeah but I, yeah, really yeah. But re yeah any actors Here's out there it. don't try this at home and <laughs> yeah yeah i'll say that and then i'll tell you not, don't do it at home exactly <laughs> don't ever do that yeah <laughs> don't do it in an audition cool you mentioned that the one of the producers was francis ford coppola did you get to meet him at all Oh, I did. Yeah, he came to the set. And I was a huge, am a huge fan, you know, of his work. Um, and he came to the set one day with his brother, Augie, um, who's Nick Cage's dad, right? All right. And so they rolled into the set one day and, um, and I got to have lunch with him. And, uh, you know, lovely, lovely guy. I, I, I have to admit, I was totally starstruck. You know, I was a bumbling idiot. You know, I, I really, I wish I had another crack at that lunch because I, I think probably I thought, you know, I had to say something interesting or witty or whatever. And instead of just having a conversation with the guy, I'd love to have had a real conversation, but I can't tell you what I said <laughs> and if it meant anything. So, but yeah, I did get to meet him. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. And thinking about the actual filming process itself, I presume you had to do the whole live cast, the head and the, uh and so on oh i what, did straws up the nose and the whole thing yeah yeah that's such an american thing of putting straws up the nose they just don't do it in the uk um really but, yeah yeah how, do, how do they let you breathe while you're getting your head cast? they wipe they wipe they wipe the plaster away okay they take cotton buds and they just wipe the plaster away um, okay. from your nose um, okay i find that extraordinary yes we've mentioned this on the show before because that to me is so bizarre. So what was, so how many pieces, how, first, okay, 
classic question. I mean, how long a process was it to actually get into the makeup? Oh, Jesus. Um, for the first movie, you know, a typical day would be like five hours, five to six hours, I would say. Wow. But the big days, you know, the ones where I had the animatronic head on the back of the creeper, that was right. a special day. You know, that was probably seven hours to get into that. You know, and you, you know what the process is like. It's like some people do better with it than others. I was lucky because I kind of really just used that as a meditation to kind of slip further and further into the character. So by the time, you know, the team was done, I was ready to work. Right. I was, oh, right. I was fully there, you know. Yeah. So what sort of time did they call you in the morning to, to come? Well, we would shoot at night. <clears throat> so we fortunately, we did night shoot. So, you know, my call would be one or two in the afternoon. Ah. So I could be ready at night. So it wasn't too bad for me. Uh, and then, you know, work all night till seven in the morning until first light and then have to get it off. My very favorite time, taking it all off, you know, hot towel time. They put that first hot towel on you when you've taken all the prosthetics off and then, you know, you have hot towel you know steams into your skin and then uh and then they usually give me a turn you know day between work days right yeah. right yeah you you had very very good makeup artists i don't recall anybody having hot towels on hellraiser ah <laughs> i had it's like best. your clean go home <laughs> I had never mind those little bits of, of glue all over you no, I was, I, I didn't, I didn't rough it. I had it pretty easy. I mean, I had a team of guys at a lens tech. Thank you very much. At the right. time. Uh, Cause I wore, you know, cataract for the extreme close-ups. I had, uh, uh, you know, uh, contact lenses. Yeah. But I had a great team led by Brian Pinnacus, um, who is a genius. Right. You know, and built that character up and is a real believer in all the old school ways. Right. He was trained by the very best and uh, he loves what he does. So yeah. It was, yeah. It was a lot of fun working with him. Did you, did you see sketches of the character before they started on the makeup process? Did we, you know, were you that far ahead of the game? I did. Were... I did. I saw some sketches. Uh, Brad Parker, our illustrator. It's interesting. Um, when I first got the role, I remember talking to Victor and him, say, him saying, you know, your look is so intense. We're going to put a little bit of prosthetic on you, but, you know, we, we might not cover you all the way up. So I really didn't know. I think it kind of evolved. And some of the first sketches that I saw that Brad Parker did were still some of the most terrifying that I've ever seen to this day. Mm -hmm. Visual mm -hmm. sketches. And I think they made it in the credits of maybe the third movie. They brought back some of the original sketches before oh, we should right. frame of the creeper. And some of that stuff is like, as you can really tell in those original sketches, you know, you don't really know if he's man or what he is, you know, it's, it, they're just off. Right. Something right. about it's just off. And so it really inspired, inspired me. You see yeah. those sketches. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that it takes about five or six, you know, between five and seven hours on the first movie. Did the process get easier over the three movies? For the second movie, not so much, because we just made it like two years after the first one. Right. But for the third movie, we just came back and did in 2017. It was quite different. You know, the material was different. It was easier to wear. Um, instead of, you know, 30 pieces or whatever it was they would put on individually. You know, I can remember with the first two movies, just my eye would be like four or five individual pieces. Right, right. You know, in the new movie in 2017, they were really able to do it in three pieces. Uh, you know, and it looked sensational, you know, but they were really able to do it in three pieces. Now, Brian might have something to say about that. But um, so it was much easier on me. It was like three hours instead of like five to seven. Right, right, right. So were they still using foam latex on the first movie? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so you moved more to silicon then in 2017, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That makes perfect sense. Now, you, how many of the, going back to the first film for a moment, how many of the stunts were you able to do? You, ah, good question. Well, of course, I want to do all of them. You know, I mean, it's my, it my, one of my first big movies, you know, when they, when they introduced me to my stuntman, I was like, would you hire this guy for me? What, you know. <laughs> uh and so you know they explain to me they're like look if you get injured you know it's a big problem you know everybody has to sit around mm. 
oh, you, we wait for you to get better or whatever. And so they, they reasoned with me, you know, that, that I couldn't do all the stunts. I did as much as I could. There was a couple that I wasn't able to do, fortunately, um, namely the one where the car hits the creeper. Yeah. Where he's going over the top of the car where the car is, is supposed to hit him, right? Yeah. Um, well, the car actually hit him. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, the wires were, we, I worked on wires a lot. And so for that particular stunt, the creeper was supposed to jump up and the car was supposed to go under. Right. And it was a simulation mm. of a, of a hit. Right. But they didn't account for the recoil, didn't account enough for the recoil of the wires. So when the stunt creeper jumped up, Hank was his name. Shout out to Hank out there, wherever you are. Hank jumped up and then the came back down because of the elasticity of the wires and and man the car hit him and Justin and Gina were both in the car at the time and so the windshield blew out uh and and scraped uh Justin had a cut on his forehead and Hank ended up in the hospital of course this happened at like three o'clock on a Friday night it's when they all happen right and the guy in the ambulance is about three hours away. You know, the techs are asleep in the ambulance, you know, and uh, it punctured his lung and broke like four ribs and he got quite banged up, you know? So I was really, wow. that message was received loud and clear by me at that, at that point, you know? Um, but anyway, he did that stunt and he did a, a couple of the flying, I think he did a couple of the flying stunts in that movie, but I, I was able to do most of them, which I right, appreciate though. Right, right, right. Yeah. But I, and I understand you managed to actually make a small appearance at the end of the first movie without makeup. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Victor thought it'd be great if I showed up as one of the cops in the, <laughs> you know, in the police station shooting myself. Right. So a little <laughs> twist of irony. So if you go back and watch the film, I'm tucked in there. You can see me in my bald head, you know uh you know being very shocked that the creepers in the, <laughs> in the police station so. <laughs> you were talking about um justin and, and gina and so on and i, I mean i i love the these, these films particularly the first couple of the films um because i found them terrifying um and i think the first one particularly is all about justin and gina it's about their relationship and how they're dealing with this weird thing and trying to get and then you have all the related characters but what did you think when you first actually finally got the scripts and you'd learned you were going to be eating people's tongues and removing their eyes what was what was your thought I loved about? it man I I just loved it I I, uh, that, I must have a sadistic quality to me Nick because I, I I thought that was great fun you know that we were pushing the envelope you know right. scenes like that so I couldn't wait couldn't wait to get at it. What did your um, parents, you were talking about your parents earlier on, what did your parents, because this is a big movie. I mean, when the first yeah. film came out, Labor Day, it blew record, you know, it made huge amounts of money. It was incredibly popular. What did your parents think about it? Um, well, I think my mom, I think my mom spent the last few years of her life apologizing to all of her friends. <laughs> you know, he's really a very nice boy. He's really nothing like the character. You know, it just wasn't their frame of reference. They just had no, it was like I'd quit and join the circus, Nick. You know, right. they just couldn't wrap their heads around it. Right. You know what I mean? So they still think it's all, you know, my mom has passed on right now. My dad's still alive, but uh, but they still don't know what to make of it. I think there was a big long gap between the first two films. Yeah. You said you'd made a couple of um, uh, a couple of years apart, and you mentioned you know, the third one's 2017, and it's a kind of a prequel to the first. I'm trying to think, is it? How oh, it's actually it's it's the in first between. And it's right between them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So was it really? So what was it like after coming coming back to that character after such a long time ago? And you know. How long had it been on, on the cards that you were going to be able to come back? Well, you know, it all kind of came together really quickly. We were supposed to, I mean, we had, we had the third movie probably set up three or four times previously. Right. And so, 
you know, every time Victor would call and say, Hey, we're, we're going to do it, man. And I'd get all fired up and then something would happen and then we wouldn't do it, you know? So we'd been in this process for a while, but actually when it finally came to be, it happened pretty quickly. You know, I had about three months to kind of wrap my head, maybe less, maybe two months to kind of wrap my head around getting back in the character. And I didn't really know, you know, how it would feel after all those years. Mm. But when I put the costume on the first time, it felt like an old glove. It just, it shocked me even. Right. You know, it was all in there somewhere still. And I was so grateful for the opportunity to come back after so long. And really, to be quite honest with you, thinking that it might never happen again. Right, right. So grateful to be there. Um, I really reveled in it. You right. Know, and, I put, and I, when I put that makeup on and that costume on again, I was like, let's go, baby. Pedal to the metal. Let's see what we can take this thing. You know, it's, it's such a joy. And you, you, you know, it's such a joy. I never really understood to come back and revisit a character because, you know, all the platform preparations already there, you know, you've mm -hmm. already done all that, you know, basic fundamental work on the character. And also you've had the benefit of time and perspective a little bit to think about the character and maybe what you do differently or some things you'd like to explore. And so now you're kind of able to pick it right back up here mm -hmm. and go to the next place with it even, you know, and to see how much further you can take it. You know, so I, I loved going back and being able to pick up in the creeper skin again. Right. You know, I just had that much more fun. I have right. many of them, you know, in the third movie, probably. So. Right, right, right. And you mentioned earlier on that, you know, that your stunt double um, got hit doing some of the flying work on, on the first film. But did that and you kind of alluded to the fact you'd done some flying work. How much flying work did you get to do over the over the three films? Well, qu quite a bit. You know, I did uh, a lot of it, most of it in the third film, just because it was a function of the budget. Right. 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 Um, but the second movie, we had a lot of money to shoot the second movie. And I had a great stuntman, um, Darren Prescott, who right. has sent him famous making you know mission impossibles and stuff like that right so, right right you know, had a great career but in the second movie you know the creeper was in the air most of the movie and so i got to do a lot uh, of the wire work um but some of the more complicated stuff darren did you know for instance when the harpoon shot the creeper off the bus and he went you know spinning out of control i didn't want any part of that damn thing you know so Dar darren did that and uh, but I got to do just enough to have a lot of a lot of fun doing it. You know, have you ever worked on wires? No, no. Well, it's no. like being a kid. It's like you get to the set and you're like, there's two cranes. You know, these these scenes where I was swooping down. It was like a crane on one side and a crane on the other, and they hoist you up in this thing. And you know, you're wearing a harness and you have two clips. You know, on each hip. And so you're cantilever. You know, so you have to really control your body weight forward and backwards but they wind you up on this one your crane and then it's action they let you go and you literally swoop down you know hauling ass down so you know after the getting over the initial shock of it it was just a rush you know it's literally like being nine years old out you know doing a, a, a zip line or something in your backyard you know so i got to do a lot of that stuff and that was fun Right. So what sort of length of days were you doing when you were doing that kind of thing? Because this is in full makeup and costume, presumably. Yes, it must have been. Yeah, yeah. No, it was full days. You know, it was full. It was nights. It right. Was those nights. Um, and for the second movie, we, we created uh, the road where the bus was on inside a giant hangar down in Long Beach. They had uh, this hangar down there where they used to build the B-17 bombers during World War II and the hangar was so big, they would start at one side of the hangar with no plane. And by the time they got to the end of the hangar, it was the plane was finished. Right, right. So it was like, you know, I don't know, 150, 200, maybe three, three or 400 feet high, you know, giant thing. And maybe, you know, three football fields long, this massive hangar. And we wow. recreated the road and we were able to control the environment a little bit in there. So we were able to shoot some days but still mostly nights. Right, you know? right. 
I had no idea. I, I, there's no sense of that in the film. That's yeah. All. Well, that's what you get when you have money, when you have a yeah. budget. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. That was nice. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you have a particular fondest, mom, fondest moment or memory from? Yes, I do have a fondest moment. <laughs> <laughs> Let me bail you out there, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, on any on any of the movies or in, in yeah, yeah, okay. For, yeah. You know, um, creatively, these movies were funny. Um, the very first scene—I don't know what it was—but the first scene always had some magic in it on all these movies. And I really, it's, it's something I just can't explain. And Victor would tell you the same thing, but I can remember the very first movie, um, the very first scene was the first time you see, actually see the creeper where he was, the kids are driving by and they see the creeper, you know, this, they see something dumping mm. body on a pipe. Yeah. And I remember the first shot and I really, Victor and I didn't even know each other that well. And um, but he said, okay, this is the first scene and you're, you know, kids are going to be driving by. We're going to be the, on the picture car, you know, uh, process trailer driving by and we're going to see you dumping, you know, bodies down. There. And I was like, that's it. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's it. You know? And, uh, so I did it and I said, do you mind if I try something different? And he said, you know, no, which was so, which was so great about working with Victor is he really gave you the latitude to, you know, Follow, trust your instincts right yeah, yeah and so it felt so much to me like he would sense the kids were were there or that were seeing him and then he knew they were the kids right yeah and then he would have that sense about him and then he, again he would want to terrorize them right from the very first frame yeah, yeah. And so i just walked to the end of the church and just kind of glared at him and uh and I heard Victor's wild laughing, you know, on the process trailer after they said cut. And, you know, anytime something worked, Victor would laugh, you know. And so I went over to the trailer. And he's like, you have no idea, you know, how scary this is going to be. What would you take into the afterlife with you in terms of entertainment? So if I had to kind of narrow it down, and I appreciate, you know, off the top of these are off at the top of your head answers. Yeah. What film would you take? What favorite film would you take with you? I, I'm sorry, man. I, I, I hate to be a cop out on this. There's no way I could pick one. Right. Okay. I, could pick one. I mean, I love The Godfather. I like uh, Godfather, of course. I, the original one and the second one, too. Um, Feel the Dreams. Um, God. Ah. I, I love really like films that take me into another world and, and uh, you know, where I can fully go into that other world. Right. It could somehow inform me about my own life. It's such a, such a talent, you know, but um, I've got, I've tried to start making a list of my favorite films for my kid. And, and that's just, it's going to be a never ending project that yeah. maybe I'll finish hopefully before I die anyway. So, <laughs> well, there's, I mean, there's a good, I mean, there's a really fascinating choices and quite happy to give you, you know, the, the box set of the Godfather series and plus field of dreams. Um, yeah. Yeah. To, to swap around. I like, I like, I like the fantastic, I like the fantasy. I like the fantastical. I love films that can break the line of reality and, and fantasy mm. and so convincingly. Mm. That's what I meant by taking me to a whole nother world that somehow yeah. convinced myself in my mind that it's real. Yes. Magic. Yeah. I believe in, I believe magic. I believe in magic, right? Yeah. I believe in something else out there. I do. I believe in just beyond us, you know, yeah. I just, I love um, the possibility of it all. Right. You know? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, th I think being understanding there are, greater forces other forces things that you know just kind of below or above or beyond the surface right um yeah no i understand that do you what about books do you are you a great reader did you have a particular genre of book oh, that you like yeah, watching, reading? great reader i, I i'm sorry to say i i'm read 
proper books less and less over the last few years, you know, but, uh, so I, I have to choose one. Is that the idea? Is that That's the idea? Yeah. If you, if okay. you know, it's a fairly well, small print, uh, you know, probably be the Bible actually. Ah, you know, good because, choice. Uh, well, I just think that, you know, no matter who your God is, I think that book is full of great characters and stories and parables that you can apply to life. And regardless of even the religious context, mm. it's a great tale. Yeah. You know, oh, I had to bring one with me. That that would probably be the one that would keep keep me entertained. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. Good choice. And as I say, as you say, I remember. I remember immediately taken back to the small copy that I remember at home and the paintings that were in it. It was one of the ones probably only had about 20 illustrations in it, but they were beautifully, beautifully done. Right. Um, and being fascinated with all these different characters. Yeah. What, a, what about a musical album? Um, you know, um, God, I'm a huge fan of music. Um, late. I don't know if this would be my all, if I gave it some thought, maybe I could come up with my all time favorite, but lately I've really been into uh, Tom Petty, right. the re-release of his Wildflowers album, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I just came back out again last week. And so I, maybe I'd probably say, if I had to say now, I'd say maybe the Tom Petty with Wildflowers album. Right. He's a poet, man. He was, he was accessible, you know, his, all of his lyrics are accessible but there's meaning behind them all. There's an abstract nature to them. You can go as kind of deep as you want, you know? Um, I love that about his music. And it's, and it's rock and roll, which I love old rock and roll, so. Yeah. Right, 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 right. And what about, are you into visual art at all? Oh, big, yeah. yeah, paintings. Yeah. Yeah. Again, and no, probably no surprise to you given what I've already said. Uh, you know, I love abstract art. Um, I'm not so much a Picasso fan. That's a little more abstract. I, I, I'm more of a Matisse guy. Ah. Where he kind of blended some reality with a little abstract, you know, enough abstractness to where you see something kind of different in it, you know, every time you look at it. Yeah. Which I really like, you know, if it was, again, if it was one thing I had to keep with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I like to be able to look back at a picture and see something different every time I look back. Right, 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 right. And what about a particularly favorite food? Do you have a go-to food, comfort food? Hey, wine. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say drink, but no, that's say, fair enough. No, that's a food stuff. Uh, I get that food beverage. Yeah. I still like that. I'm still comforted by that. So I would say <laughs> that. Uh, oh man, uh, yeah, I like a good steak. You know, the creeper likes him some red meat. <laughs> So, and ice cream so steak ice cream and red wine what and flavor I, ice cream pretty much all flavors really uh, only, only flavors i don't like are sherbet uh, and i don't like the really nutty ones you know but uh but i'm a fan of uh i'm a fan of neapolitan okay i'm a fan of um the caramel, the chocolate caramel, the peanut butter chocolate. I like Cherries Garcia. Ben and Jerry's got a great Cherries Garcia that I that my my daughter just ate all of mine just yesterday. As a matter of fact, I'm still a little bit pissed about that. <laughs> I came home from a road trip and it was all gone. So anyway, Cherries <laughs> Garcia. Yeah. So, yeah. so if I could have that, I might survive. Right, yeah. right, yeah. right, right, right. Well, that that sounds like a great. That sounds like a fascinating list as well. Really fascinating. Jonathan, thank you so very much for spending uh, your time. Great. great to see your face again, man. You too. Well, that was fascinating. I had no idea some of that was filmed in an aircraft hangar. And Jonathan is such a great guy. Next week on The Chattering Hour, I'm joined by the crypt keeper himself, John Cassia. See you then. And in the meantime, stay safe. And well.